Howdy folks, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am your host, the Mighty Bjorn, and today for you, I'm going to be talking a bit about Dungeons and Dragons here, and actually I'm going to be talking a bit about a previous video I had done, but first, uh, I it's been a while since I've done this, but I'm going to plug my Patreon channel. It's a good way to provide the channel additional support, helps out with the budget, things of that nature, um, because yeah, YouTube really doesn't, uh, really doesn't provide too much, because YouTube doesn't like to provide creators much in the, the way of funds. But anyway, I'm going to leave it at that. The link is down below in the video description. Now let's dive on into today's video, which is a video I've covered in the past, but I covered really lightly, and that was about pole arms. Now what I'm going to do with today's video versus my previous video, which was make pole arms great again, um... Today's video, I'm going to be focused more on why pole arms was historically so important and just to kind of give a baseline of, of yeah, why they were so important is the best way to, to really put it. Now, one thing I stated in my previous video about Make Pole Arms Great Again is that they were the AK-47 of their time, and realistically, they were. They were more or less the assault weapon and with that being said they also dominated the battlefield now with today's video as i do this dive in i'm also including spears in this conversation as well especially the longer spears you know spears where you start getting up to the the eight ten foot length range um as well as i'm also going to be discussing al um uh, the all pike because that is, interestingly enough, not many people consider spears as a pull arm. They consider spears as their own weapon, but then they consider the alpike as, or the pike, as its own pull arm, which never made sense to me because an alpike is just a really long spear with some redesign in the head itself. Now, with that being said, Okay, the, the main thing is, is, is pole arms, particularly spears, go way back. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of documentation about spears being part of various military units over the years, including the Spartans, but I'm sure you can go even further back. You could probably go as far back as caveman to, you know, essentially find use of spears, particularly for hunting in that case, but they also would have been used for warfare. And spears pretty much, well, pole arms in particular, pretty much was on the battlefield up until the era of pike and shot. And actually, you could find pole arms on the battlefield even after that, even into the more modern era. Um, even muskets, essentially, is, you know, once you put a bayonet on an old school musket, was even a spear in its own right. So the use of a long reach weapon like a pole arm or a spear really hasn't faded. They, they've kind of faded to obscurity, but it's still around, I want to say. And with all that, I want to say as a but why is they are very versatile weapons and they are very useful weapons. I'm going to dive into the usefulness here in a bit. But let's discuss the versatility as first. You can see here, there is multiple different types of pole arms. And each pole arm design has its own strengths and weaknesses within its design. So a lot of different types of pole arms that created a lot of different types of versatility. Now that being said, realistically, the way you would fight from one pole arm to the next really wouldn't change all that much especially when you get to the more legitimate pole arms, such as the Bill Hook and the the Bardiche and the Bechti Corbin and things of that nature. They were all kind of similar to one another, at least in the way you would use them in a fight. Now, of course, they were really important during the days of the Lance, and that's because, well, Lances had a limitation. Lances were designed in such a way that they could only be Essentially, they were only used one-handed because, of course, the knight would have to hold onto the reins with his other hand. And lances provided knights 
really great reach as well as a very effective anti-armor weapon. Uh, lances were excellent for penetrating armor. Um, but with that being said, there was limitations to them. And this is kind of one area where the polearm became important because for an infantryman, the best weapon to deal with cavalry, or particularly knights, was the polearm. And that was one reason is because of the reach of a polearm. Your average polearm would be roughly 10 foot long. And most of the time, that would be longer than the lance, actually. So that would kind of give them a little bit of an edge. Not much of an edge until you start getting into the pike, where you start essentially getting spears that are 20 foot long. But it, it did give them a bit of an edge and a way to, to protect themselves from cavalry units. Understand at the time, we're talking, you know, 12th, 13th, 14th century, even into the 15th century, mounted armored knights was actually an extreme danger to infantry, or, well, at least foot infantry units. And one way to counteract that was with pole arms. Pole arms was also an important hunting implement, particularly the boar spear. Now, I know the boar spear has an actual name. I really don't know what the name of the boar spear is off the top of my head. Uh, with that being said, usually if you're sitting there having a conversation about spears and pole arms and you bring up the boar spear, most people will know what spear you're talking about because these are actually pretty well-documented spears. And these were particularly designed for boar hunting. So for those of you who play Kingdom Come Deliverance, and the ones that are more along the lines of the history buffs will know right away that the section of the game where you go boar hunting with uh, Sir Kipon uh, is kind of incorrect because they make you hunt a boar with a bow. And understand that hunting boar with a bow was, at that time, very dangerous. It still can be quite dangerous, actually, to hunt a boar with a bow. Because the boar could actually turn on you and, and charge you. More than likely, even if you do get a kill shot on the boar, it will not die right away using a bow. So they will, they will, they could charge you. The idea of the boar spear was, instead of using a bow, is when you did find a boar, if the boar would charge you, you would stab the boar with the boar spear. And essentially control it, pin it, whatever. Um, but the it had special prongs sticking out the side of the shaft to prevent the boar from actually running further up the shaft. Uh, so there's quite a kind of bit of an indication there of how dangerous it could be to hunt boar uh, when they needed a special spear uh, design to hunt boar. And actually, this was an extremely effective way to hunt boar, um, more so than the bow. Now, the next thing I want to point out, too, is also the polearm's effectiveness against armor. Polearms was probably one of the most effective weapons against armor. There's multiple reasons why, which I'll get into here in a little bit, but it just needs to be stated about how effective polearms were against armor or was against armor. Um, now, there was other weapons that might you might be able to consider might be more effective against armor. Arguments could be made for, like, the military pick, the war hammer, and the mace. But pole arms did have a huge edge when you compile the fact of it also is a two-handed weapon. So it gives a little bit more power, a little bit more reach, which is actually one th another thing I want to discuss too, which I kind of alluded to earlier with cavalry. But cavalry wasn't the only reason to have spears. Essentially, any unit that would charge a polearm unit was definitely at some type of threat because of the reach advantage those units would have. So that is actually one reason why polearms were actually heavily, so heavily used by military units. Um, 
they were just effective at receiving charges, if you will, which Dungeons & Dragons actually does reflect that by a polearm getting an automatic times two damage if you are set to receive a charge. So I actually like that mechanic. I think that's a really good mechanic to have. Polearms itself also provided, <clears throat> provided leverage. Uh, it's easier to trip someone with a two-handed weapon than it would be with a one-handed weapon because you got leverage. You can just kind of use it as a, a long pry bar. And, and we all know how leverage works. I don't need to dive too much into leverage, but it does... It needs to be stated about the leverage advantage that pole arms have, especially over other military arms of the time. Now, of course, we can also discuss the ease of training. Now, this isn't going to be for all, all pole arms, and it's realistically the amount of training you receive is how effective you're going to be with a pole arm. However, for common, I want to say common basic effectiveness, um, you can get away with very minimalist training, especially when you look into something like the spear, where you can have an 8, 10-foot long spear, and essentially all you're really doing with a spear is thrusting. Um, now, there was spears that was designed for cutting as well, but they weren't extremely common, or at least so it would seem, uh, looking at different historical documentation and things of that nature, that most spears were just more or less a piece of tipped steel. And their primary focus was thrusting. Now, with that being said, as you, you know, give you a couple examples of some pull arms here, here is a spear. And as you can see, this is not a thrust and cut type spear. This is just a pointed spear. Now, sure, you could probably cut with it. It wouldn't give you a very good cut. Not like that would matter if you're fighting an armored opponent. You would probably just want to stab them as hard as you could to try and penetrate their thick armor. With that being said, the spear was also good at receiving charges and things of that nature because of its length and it's essentially a metal spike. Uh, you can more or less use it as like a dead drop or I think it's actually called a death drop where basically you you let your charging opponent more or less skewer themselves on your spear. Of course, then you get into the bill hook, which the bill hook could be, this is actually a really great, really versatile weapon. It can be used for chopping and cutting. Um, you can also hook opponent's limbs, shields, weapons with it. You have the, the forward hook there, which you could do that with. You also have the back hook. The back hook could also be kind of used as like a pick. If you kind of, you know, swung downward towards your opponent, you could use that as a pick to, to stab through your opponent's armor or maybe a weak spot. Um, and then, of course, with this version here, you also have a thrusting spike in itself. Now, with that being said, that was not on all bill hooks. Some bill hooks only had the hook and the back spike. Um, there was also some different types of back spikes that were used. But basically, this just kind of earmarks how versatile these weapons were. Now, the next one I want to talk about here a little bit is the Beck de Corbin, which essentially takes a Warhammer head and sticks it on a 8, 10-foot long pole. And essentially what you have is, is you just have a really, really nasty hammer. Um, now, you do have a back spike on the head once again, so you can kind of use that for maybe hooking opponent shields, limbs, weapons, whatever. And then you have a thrusting tip, so if you have to stab with it, you can. Or if you have to receive a charge, you can. Um, and then, of course, you have that big old nasty hammerhead, which is actually one good feature about the Beck de Corbin, as uh, if you could land a really good shot on a helmet, that would definitely do a lot of damage to the helmet. This also had a quite heavy head, so it would actually give a, quite a bit of heft behind your swing. Uh, it would almost assist your swing, actually, as you went to impact on your opponent. However, the one flaw with the Beck de Corbin is, is you have a really small striking surface. Um, so that is kind of one thing that is a flaw with the Beck de Corbin. But this was actually a really effective weapon against plate armor, which is more or less what it was designed to deal with. 
Now on to my personal favorite, the Halberd. I like this weapon. I think this is one of the best pole arms designed. Now this would be counter to the bill hook. Um, both weapons kind of ran the same time, around the same time of each other, and it was more or less where you were in the world is where you would find what weapon. Um, the Bechtacorb, or sorry, the uh, the bill hook was more of an Italian thing. You could actually get an Italian bill. Uh, the British also liked the bill hook as well. While on their other hand, the Swiss, uh, Germany, and some other neighboring countries really liked the halberd, but essentially what you have is, is you have an axe head with a long thrusting spike on top of the head. Now you could use this, once again, to hook opponents' weapons, shields, etc. You can actually do this in Dungeons Dragons. It's actually a really good weapon for hooking things with. But then, of course, once again, you have that really nice long spear shank, if you will, to stab an opponent if you need to or to set to receive charge so that's actually one interesting thing about pole arms almost all pole arms has some implement to be used as a spear built into the pole arm so pole arms kind of it was kind of like a let's take the axe and put it on a spear let's take the war hammer and put it on a spear let's take essentially a sword blade and put it on a spear all these different weapons really offshooted from the spear and it actually made essentially made the spear a more effective weapon in certain regards not necessarily all regards now the next thing i want to talk about with the with pole arms is the cheap price pole arms Pole arms, when compared to such weapons such as the arming sword, were actually quite cheap weapons. Especially if you look at the spear, the spear is actually much cheaper than an arming sword. Or if you open up your player's handbook, you'll see that the the spear um, is actually cheaper than the long sword because the for some odd reason, Dungeons Dragons calls the long sword the arming sword. I ain't going to get into that. I've I've already discussed that before. Um, but you'll find that. You know, many of the pole arms are equal to or cheaper than other weapons, especially when you start getting into the weapons like great swords and the great axe and things of that nature. They're all kind of, you know, either in the same ballpark or cheaper. So that's one thing that's got to be said, and that's one thing that's also has to be considered when arming a military is how many of these weapons can I field? Because the more you can field, the better. And this was extremely important during a time where essentially a duke or a baron may have to be may be tasked with raising a standing army of 80 or 100 troops in the name of a king's crusade, maybe even more. And usually they would go with the cheapest implements possible. So typically you would find a lot of spears in formations because spears were so cheap to make. Essentially you have a very long wooden shaft with a dagger attached to the end of it for, for lack of a better term. Um, and so that's one reason they were extremely common. And when you consider their price versus other weapons, such as the, like the long sword, uh, the halberd and the long sword, if I remember correctly, they're about the same price. I actually think the halberd is 12 gold and the long sword is 15 gold in the D and D player's handbook. And with that being said, actually, between the two weapons, while the longsword is kind of a badge of office and does have quite a bit of versatility to it for a single-handed weapon, the halberd was the be would be the better option to deal with armor. Now, of course, that's not really well reflected within Dungeons & Dragons, but there's a lot of things that is reflected within Dungeons & Dragons, such as the reach and being able to hook an opponent's weapon and trip an opponent and things of that nature so there's a lot of advantages to pole arms versus other weapons particularly swords now there was some flaws if you will shortcomings if you will with pole arms particularly with shields if if a, a shieldman could close in to someone using a pole arm uh it usually was not good news for the guy that was using the pole arm but understand these weapons were 
mostly used as a battle line weapon, so it would be difficult for someone with a sword and shield to charge down someone with a polearm, especially in the sense of a, a large battle where there's multiple people and military formations and etc. The other flaw, too, with polearms was actually archers. Archers could, uh, you know, there, there was not much you could do to defend yourself from archers because you typically, as a polearm, you wouldn't have a shield. Um, just throwing that out there is a typically, let alone you wouldn't really be using your shield if you're trying to use a polearm because polearms require two hands to use. Um, because we're talking, I mean, this is this is actually quite a bit of a short spear here that he's using with two hands. Uh, most of the time you'd use a longer spear somewhere around 8 to 10 foot long. Uh, it'd be really hard to control that spear with one hand at that length. But so there's just some things about pole arms. Uh, I would say another shortcoming too, particularly with Dungeons Dragons and like an adventuring party is carrying it around. You know, you really wouldn't want to carry around a pole arm all day long. And uh, for tighter spaces such as dungeons, that can be quite a bit of a, a problem. Now, one thing I did forget to mention though is the penalty for pole arms that if an opponent can move adjacent to an opponent using a pole arm. I'm not sure if it's something they kept around in fifth edition, but it was around for fourth and it was around for 3.5. And actually, I think all editions previous to that, that you would actually receive a penalty trying to use your pole arm against an adjacent opponent, which basically means the opponent is breathing in your face. And that was one thing that such weapons like the Warhammer, the Battle Axe, the Morning Star, etc., does not suffer from. So. That needs to be said, even though I did mention that kind of in the flaws, but I didn't really point out the uh, the the penalty that you receive in-game, if you will, because a part of this discussion was in the sense of Dungeons & Dragons. Um, and it, I still stand by what I said earlier about the whole discussion with the Make Pole Arms Great Again video, about that there needs to be much more implementation of pole arms within your Dungeons & Dragons campaign. And this is something that you probably should think about too, because um, pole arms was a massive weapon on the battlefield. They dominated the battlefield. They really did for a lo very long time, and particularly up until you start getting into the days, of, well, even in during the days of pike and shot. Really, up until more modern, you know, like the 20th century, where um, you know. Rifles were becoming more accurate. Rifles were bolt action. You know, there was belt-fed machine guns and et cetera. And pretty much by that point, the polearm was obsolete. But anyway, folks, I am going to wrap this video up at that. This actually took longer than I thought it would. But hopefully you all enjoyed it. Thank you very much for tuning in. And have yourself a wonderful day.